Welcome to the fifth edition of the Bloop and a Blast podcast with myself, Justin Casuccio, and my co-host, Luke Scott. And Luke, we got a good show for the listeners today. We, uh, we're going to go over some around the horn early season all-stars. We're going to get into a good Jays talk because I know there's a lot to discuss. It's been a frustrating week, but we're going to try to put a positive spin on things. And uh, But first and foremost, I just wanted to ask you how your May 2-4 weekend went because uh, Victoria Day is always a, a great weekend for uh, all Canadians. And uh, what would you get up to? Yeah, May 2-4 was a success on my end. Uh, I probably had one of my favorite weekends in a while. Was able to get out to the beach, uh, play some spike ball, throw the football around, hang out with some friends. I bought a tapestry off a a nudist that was probably uh, something that stuck out for me uh, in terms of uh, (laughs) things I didn't expect myself to be doing over the weekend. But there I was, long weekend, why not? Uh, For context, I was actually at a nudist beach. So I was at Rec Beach, which is actually on the UBC campus. And it's not nudist in the sense that everyone there has to be nude. So I was still fully clothed. Well, I was in my bathing suit. But there are a lot of nudists that do frequent that beach. And it is quite an interesting setup where it's a very eclectic mix of people. You have, you know, drum circles and uh, people gathering around like it's a festival. And then you have your average university student, you know, young professional type crowd who are doing as what I was saying uh, we were up to, which is, you know, throwing the football around, playing spike ball just like sort of drinking, drinking on the beach and whatnot. So it was quite interesting. Uh, my, my first purchase off uh, a guy who was not wearing any pants. Uh, I had a, a, a guy dressed as a wizard come up to me wow. with a free tarot reading sign, try to read me my fortune. Little did I know when he put the sign down that uh, I was going to be greeted by uh, a little bit more than I bargained for. So it was very interesting. It was an eye-opening experience to be sure. But I would not trade it for anything because, you know, it was sunny out and we were just having a good time, enjoying the long weekend. And by the end, I, I definitely adjusted. Um, no no judgment on the, on the nudists that were there. Uh, it just took a little time for me to get my head around it. So um, <laughs> overall, overall, definitely a success. And I hope you had a good weekend, too. What did, what did you get up to? Yeah, well, first of all, it sounds like you got the full package there. That's uh, quite the interesting the weekend you had. And uh, it sounds, uh, sounds like quite the uh, the hippie beach that you were at there. And um, I know that in Ontario, we've got a few uh, nudist resorts. I know there's, uh, what's there, one in Poose Lynch out there near, near Guelph. <laughs> and balls, balls. I think Ponderosa is another one. Every time I'm out that way, yeah, yeah it balls, falls. Yeah. Every time I'm out that way, I always kind of laugh at, uh, about the Poose Lynch. That's a... Uh, it's always one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, my May 2-4 was good, too. Um, just went uh, went up to Molly's, wanted to go swimming, didn't see one ray of sunshine, which was a bit disappointing, but it's a bummer. Uh, cut that trip short a little bit due to the inclement weather, and then we came home, and uh, the sun just came out, and it was a great weekend after that. I had a good barbecue, um, had some chicken, had some steak, some potato salad, the whole deal. It was just uh, what you'd expect uh, from a long weekend, and uh, definitely a great to have the day off. Uh, on the Monday there as well. Nice. Eating nice. I love that. I love that. Um, I actually, I got my vaccine. I didn't mention got my vaccine on the Sunday and was just completely out of commission on the Monday. So that day was complete right off for me. I was actually supposed to work on the Monday and turned out that I couldn't leave my bed because just got hit hard, which I hadn't heard very frequently. Most people I spoke to did not struggle with getting their vaccine, but I was very much, uh, put up and out for about 18 hours or so, just lightheaded, headache, chills, cold sweats, body aches, all, you know, the whole nine yards, not really much of an appetite. Yeah, it's time for the one dose summer, as Trudeau says. And uh, actually, today is my uh, two week mark for my vaccine. So I'm all nice. good for, good to go, ready to uh, lick some door handles and uh, inside of Hell some. yeah. Too. And that's great, man. It's too bad that you had a, a negative reaction to it, though. I, I didn't experience that. Um, just had a bit of a soreness in the arm. But uh, it's great that uh, the rollout is happening and that a lot more people here are, are getting the shot. Um, do you want to get into the baseball for this week, Luke? I think that that's, yeah. uh, that'll wrap up the intro there. I have some news and notes to go over and, okay. um, okay. one that I'd like to talk about actually is Zach Plesak. And did you All hear right. about the injury that he sustained, uh, while aggressively ripping off his shirt? 
<laughs> well, I don't know who is ripping off his shirt for. I think that'd be the better question. But I just find it interesting that, you know, Cleveland as an organization, just throw him under the bus a little bit there. If it was up to me, I'd kind of want to protect my player a little bit. And, you know, oh, he, he heard it in uh, batting practice or something. I don't know. I'd make something up. I don't want to make the guy sound like an idiot. Because when you tell the general <laughs> public, like, hey, this dude who we're paying millions of dollars broke his the hand and his fingers taking his shirt off too fast he just makes him sound like a like a dork kind of but i mean you got a puss lynch yeah he sounds like it um so i don't know it's interesting i i did hear that he got hurt i didn't know the specific reason how but uh, he's a young guy i don't know how many brain cells it takes to take your shirt off but um maybe he's better at throwing a baseball than he is at you know getting undressed so can't really say much the Baseball players are humans too, so I guess I wish him a speedy recovery and hope that you know he's able to keep that uh, season turnaround going when he gets back off the IL because he was really starting to throw the ball well and uh, you know was pretty happy to see it to be honest. Even though I ragged on him a little bit at the start of the season, the last few starts though I don't know if you noticed he were pretty bad um, and he was trending uh, back to kind of the police act that we weren't sure about. Um, but yeah, that was too bad for the tribe. It's also unfortunate, especially on the heels of losing uh, Franmil Reyes with that oblique strain. He's out for seven weeks. So um, it's kind of too bad. Uh, bad for Shane Bieber and those guys because the Indians are playing good baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like the the Rays in the sense that uh, they can lose key players and uh, keep putting a successful product on the field. It's, uh, they're one of those organizations that uh, I, de- I definitely respect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another notable injury recently, Marcelo Zuna as well went down. Um, we've seen just uh, just this really crazy amount of injuries. Brandon Belt, I think, hit the IL as well just very recently. Uh, Tyler O'Neill as well with a broken finger. These are just the ones that come off the top of my head that I was just reading into. Um, but I maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm paying more attention this year. But it seems like there's just more injuries than there ever have been before, and a lot more setbacks with injuries and and players as well. So uh, I just want to get your take. Do you think guys are becoming less uh, durable, or is it just the way the sport is and there's more caution and precaution taken for anyone with an injury? I think that the shortened season last year has something to do with it. And by the way. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I think that there may be something to the gas station uh, nominees or or, uh, people who have been chosen for our gas station segments going down with these injuries. First, we had Dustin May. Uh, He got Tommy John. Uh, Second was Huascar Yanoa, which I mentioned last week. He also had a uh, frustration-induced injury himself, uh, something similar to Plesak um, last week. And that's just so frustrating for fans, man, when you have a guy who's who's dealing, who's um, shutting the door and and really helping your team, and then they just kind of, in a fit of rage, uh, really really hurt the team and, and fuck everything up. It's too bad. And then obviously the third one, I think you mentioned please sack uh, as one of your uh, opening day gas station uh, segment guys. So I'm going to not knock on wood because I don't want that to be the case, but I do think there might, might be something to uh, the fact that we have uh, started something here uh, that's not too good for these pitchers. Yeah. If I was a pitcher in the major leagues, I would not want to be appearing on the gas station section of this podcast. Tell you, tell you that for free. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. We're still going to run the segment. I mean, it's a great segment. So um, just take care of yourself. If your name gets listed, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. You've been warned. You've been warned. warned. (laughs) um, Another thing I wanted to mention today was uh, Dodgers fans taking over Minute Maid Park. I don't know if you saw that today, but they were booing the Astros at the at their own home park and i thought that that really needed to happen because i think the astros have had that safe haven of just playing in front of their fans and um having that fake uh hometown cheer oh yeah we're the 2017 champs they still have the fucking banner raised and i think it was great that at least for one or two times you got to be humbled by some road fans that are come gonna come in and make it feel like they're home yeah, I personally love that, uh, especially when it's Jays fans going into Seattle or other you know spots around uh, around the league and making their presence felt. I think Seattle is probably the uh, one most significant road site where you will see Jays fans outnumbering um, the home team. 
So we see it in hockey as well. The Leafs do that, the same thing in, in Ottawa against the Sens. It, it's always a cool sight to see, especially when uh, you, it's your team that you're cheering for. And as someone who definitely is not on the Astros side for what they did through the playoffs and how they won that championship, um, you know, as, as you mentioned back in 2017, good on uh, the Dodgers fans. And honestly, the Astros deserve it because, uh, I don't know, no more of Jose's good signs. I'll say that he's... Uh, uh, he's he's done his damage, and it's time uh, time for them to sort of I don't know just hear the public court of opinion and have to deal with the, the mistakes they made. And Carlos Correa can cry all he wants, but you know you made your bed. Now it's time to sleep in it. It's time to sleep in it. That's a great point. Um, Juan Soto, did you see on the weekend they were playing the Orioles, and he uh, had a pop up to the catcher that looked like it was going to be going foul, uh, came back into f- uh, fair territory and actually dropped right in front of the pitcher's mound. And the only problem was he actually didn't run to first. He thought it was going foul. And so uh, it was a bit of a controversy. The The Nats ended up getting the victory, but Davey Martinez wasn't happy about it. And he actually made uh, Juan Soto apologize to his teammates. So it's good to see that the accountability is there uh, for no matter who it is in the clubhouse, that uh, that, that kind of shit is unacceptable. Because uh, one thing that drives me nuts as a fan is just seeing a guy uh, not legging out, um, you know, routine fly balls, even if, you, I mean, because you never know, right? You never know if it's going to drop and you just always got to leg them out. Yeah, another guy who's famous for that as well is Javi Baez. He also is known for not running out any sort of grounders or any sort of pop-ups, bloop singles, anything like that. So I think it's good. You got to set the set the bar pretty high and hold people accountable for their actions. I think there's a difference between that type of managing style and a Tony La Russa managing style, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely get into that a little bit down the road. Well, let's get into it right now, I'd say, because Tony La Russa... Uh, what, what's there to say, Luke? This guy's a clown. Uh, I was willing to look past the two DUIs that he uh, had before he was named the manager of the White Sox. But now that he's just showing his true colors, showing his arrogance, I think it's time to really air him out. Uh, because what happened there with German Mercedes was absolutely unacceptable. First of all, if we can just do a slow uh, backtrack as to the events that happened, uh, Williams Ostadio of the Twins uh, came in in a 15-4 blowout and basically was serving up meatballs 47 miles an hour um, to the White Sox. And Yerman Mercedes, understandably, wanted to keep playing baseball because, look, this is a longtime journeyman. He wants to come up and show that he belongs here. He wants to get paid. And how you get paid is by putting up stats. And talk about disrespect in the game. What's disrespect in the game is putting in position players uh, onto the mound where they have no business being there and just expecting that they're going to lay down and uh, not compete. Um, That would be uh, not doing the game. That would be doing the game a disservice. And I think that um, La Russa coming out and saying that uh, that was a Bush League move for Mercedes Look, Larissa, it's a this the dawn of a new era. It's a new day, and if you can't catch up with uh, the times, then you're going to get left behind because everyone in that clubhouse was on Mercedes' side. Yeah, I think as well. Just he's kind of a dinosaur. He's just an old, old man, and is very old fashioned. And as we look at the differences and gaps between different generations, we notice that there's definitely behavior types and accepted practices from one generation to the next, whether it's baseball or any sort of organized sport or even industry, profession, etc. The fact that this man is so far out of his depth and so far uh, away and disconnected from his own players to realize the comments that he's making are going to have inflammatory results is just sort of shocking because, I mean, he's getting paid millions and millions of dollars a year. He's there to have his players' backs, and he's there to get the most out of them. If he thinks this is getting the most out of them, then all it's going to get him is a kick in the pants and have the team turn against him. Um, I I don't know. I don't understand it. I think that if you're a manager, you should be a player's first manager, and that's just the way that the game is going. And if you really think that holding up for the integrity of the game means throwing your own players under the bus, then I think you have your priorities mixed up because let's be honest, no one other than Tony La Russa right now um, really feels that sympathetic to the way that he handled that situation. So I think it's honestly disgraceful. I don't think 
that there is room for the game in the way that he handled that situation. And I don't think there's room in the game for just expecting players to lay down their bats when they're up a lot of runs. Oh, let's not hurt their feelings. You're professionals. You should be able to take it on the chin. Like just dust your ego off and just finish the game, play properly. Well, it's also not about their egos. Baseball is the only sport, uh, major sport in North America, that's not a time sport. And how many times have we seen it where, uh, you know, a team is up by 10 or 11 runs. Next thing you know, it's a two or three run ball game. And it happens all the time because you you just have to ensure that you're you're giving the game everything it deserves uh, in terms of uh, not cheating the fans. The fans come to see home runs. They don't come to see uh, you take 3-0 uh, pitches. It just makes no sense to me. The whole thing really irritates me. And uh, – the twins also the way they handed this like Tyler Duffy throwing behind Mercedes and then the Russo saying that he was right to throw at him or that he had no problem with him throwing at him. Oh, uh, that just, it drives me nuts. I think this guy really needs to go. And I think it's going to be, it's not going to be long before the White Sox players um, have a, just a revolt against this guy because Lance Lynn spoke out, Tim Anderson, these guys, they had Mercedes back and the arrogance of La Russa to say, well, Lance Lynn's got a locker. I've got an office. Okay. Well, dude, it's, I've had enough of you. And I think a lot of people have had enough of this guy. Uh, just don't drink and drive. That's all I have to say. And from one manager to another, I want to talk about Dave Mattingly, the manager of the Miami Marlins. He's saying that some of these games are unwatchable right now due to the rise in strikeouts and hitters' inability to consistently put the ball in play. So with all these no-hitters we've seen, um, I think this is really a problem that's coming to the forefront in terms of batters not being able to consistently make contact, but also pitchers uh, making too much contact with batters because there's been a hit by pitch epidemic and i wanted to know some of your thoughts on that uh first of all i want to know if you think there should be consequences for um pitchers throwing at hitters even if there's no intent above the shoulders because we're seeing some scary incidents right now we saw kevin pilar and bryce harper recently get hit in the face and it's just an ugly situation yeah, there could be more severe consequences. I, it's just hard to distinguish between the times that were accidental and the times that are intentional. Obviously, when you have guys throwing behind other players who, for example, in the UN Mercedes situation, just hit uh, the ball out on a 3-0 count and, and at a outrageously lopsided game, that makes sense. Okay, that was definitely intentional. You can call that out, but sometimes a guy just misses up and in and uh, it can be dangerous so it it is it is tough to draw the line there i don't exactly know how you'd be able to distinguish one from the other in a not completely obvious situation but anything that right now is helping out hitters just make more consistent contact i think is important because it is becoming less of an enjoyable game when it's just strikeouts all the time um i defense is one of the best parts of the game if you ever watch highlight reels or the top 100 defensive plays of the year i'd say that's i'd rather watch that than the top 100 home runs of the year every time a home run looks the same almost every time a strikeout looks the same almost every time but watching a guy play defense go deep in the hole you know pivot crow hop throw throw over to second and turn two on a play that probably should have been a single is ridiculous and something that is beautiful in its own right so yeah whatever way you can have hitters um, make more contact with the ball i'm on board for i'm just not sure that finding pitchers for hitting batters intentionally or unintentionally is going to do that agreed um and from the first perspective of hitters not being able to make contact with pitchers i think that the solution really is the only solution i see is to lower the mound because i don't think moving the mound back is right you're you're changing the dimensions of the game at that point you just need to lower the mound i think because look you're not putting that toothpaste back in the tube these guys are throwing 100 miles an hour and it wasn't like that 10 years ago even uh where like we talked about that was a rarity these days Guys have velocity and the hitters are trying to catch up to it and they're doing a better job of consistently, uh, you know, catching up to that, those high speeds. But at the same time, 100 miles an hour is still really, really hard to hit. So you're just going to continue to see struggles like this because of physics. It's just it's really incredibly hard to hit a 100 mile an hour fastball. And I think that that's that's never going away. That's here to stay. These guys have the mechanics to uh, make that happen. And that's just kind of the situation. So lower the mound is my opinion on uh, getting more balls in play. You can move the mound back, I guess, but I don't think a lot of guys will be on board for that. I think that that's uh, a bit too drastic. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good point. I, that would be a huge change. Uh, it would be more effective than trying to police the application of pine tar and other substances to the ball, but trying to get pitchers to get on board with that would be quite difficult um, as I'm sure there would be some sort of exercise or overuse injuries based on different muscle groups being activated, et cetera, et cetera. I do think that's, that's a, a pretty good uh, suggestion though. One that would probably need to be grandfathered in a little bit. But moving on to looking at the All-Star game that's coming up, I uh, wanted to hear your take on who you thought were your early season, maybe a little bit too early, but still early season um, All-Star picks uh, around the horn and uh, also for starting pitchers as well. Yeah, this is great. This is part of our Around the Horn segment where we're going to look at early season All-Stars. And I'm going to start in the American League. Um, so I'll start at uh, the first position, which uh, is starting pitcher. And that's going to be Garrett Cole for me. He's been dominant, obviously. I think there was some talk that maybe Shane Bieber had uh, overtaken him as the best pitcher in the AL. And Garrett Cole has, you know, he's he's had that streak of the strikeouts to walks, uh, similar to Corbin Burns, but has got a little bit less uh, talked about just because it wasn't to start the season. It was a little bit under the radar that way. Um, Garrett Cole is my starting pitcher. And I'll throw it over to you at number two, which is catcher for the American League. Starting pitcher on my end in the American League as well. I'm going to go with John Means. Um, 1.79 ERA, uh, over 65.1 innings pitched. He's got 64 Ks, so not a crazy high K per nine, um, but still a whip uh, under one at 0.75. Pretty good percentage on my end, and I think he's uh, well-deserving, um, especially with the no hitter he threw that really was a perfect game if not for uh, a dropped third strike um pass ball uh, that allowed a, a runner to get on first base um so I, i'm gonna put john means down as uh, one of my starting pitchers there for the al cool and would you put john means as your starter for the game because um we're going to pick five starting pitchers from each league uh, and while we're on the topic of pitcher, we might as well rhyme off the rest of those five. So if you don't mind, I'm going to rhyme off uh, the five that I have here is Garrett Cole, Shane Bieber, Tyler Glass now, Carlos Rodon, and Shohei Otani. Uh, so if you want to quickly go run through your starting rotation for the AL, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll just throw John, John Means out there to start the game. Why not? A uh, bit controversial, but I think he's deserved it with, with how he's pitched so far this year. Um, I think you have to put Garrett Cole uh, there as well. I'd put Hyun Jin Ryu as well for another uh, starting pitcher. A little bit off the board, uh, but a guy who I've been pretty impressed with so far is Aaron Savale. Um, you know, yes. he's pitched really well. He's 7-1 and one right now. You know, he's throwing 68 innings, so he's chewing up innings. Um, yes, he's not striking out a ton of guys. He's only got a 7 um, K per nine, but he's just an effective pitcher. And I think that's just who he is, uh, the type of guy that he is. Um, lastly, I will kind of copy your, your side there with Tyler glass. Now he's looked unbelievable this year. Um, 62 innings pitched as well. Um, with a 12.6 K per nine. So, uh, in, in total, that's, th- those are my five, John means, Hyun Jin Ryu, um, Aaron Savale, um, Tyler Glasnow. And then uh, just to round it out, um, I kind of want to go off the board here a little bit. Um, yeah. not too far off the board, but uh, a pick who I kind of hated on a little bit was Lance McCullers. So I, I think I'll throw him in the All Star game. Why not? Um, yeah, cool. I think there's other guys who could be potentially more more deserving. I think you you got to put Shane Bieber in there too. But just to just to be controversial, you already mentioned him. I'm going to throw throw McCullers down. Yeah, it's good to give different guys. Obviously, I mean, it's probably you know a lot of these guys would be your picks if you were the manager, but uh, it's good to get some different perspectives too. Over to the catcher, and Salvador Perez is going to be my catcher for the American League. I think um, there's a lot of there's a few different guys that are uh, deserving, uh, and maybe you'll have one of those guys as your picks, or if you agree, uh, we can talk about Sal Perez and uh, how he's a great game caller. I mean, let's just go off of, with a guy we were talking about earlier and let's throw Euron Mercedes in the All-Star game. I mean, he's eligible at catcher. Why not? Let's put him in yeah, there. <laughs> for sure. I don't know if he's caught all that many games, uh, but he's definitely eligible and he's deserving as well. So it's great to talk about him. Another guy I want to mention is Mike Zanino. He's got 11 home runs uh, and he's he's really calling great games for the Rays there uh, as we talked about how how consistent they've been so far. So from catcher, we're going to throw it down to third, and I'll let you give your third baseman for the AL. All right. Um, third baseman for the AL. It's going to bring up my notes here. Um, this is k- kind of a hard decision, but uh, I think overall, um, 
the one of the best third basemen in the league so far uh, who's really not disappointed is Alex Bregman. Um, I think someone who's turned it on really uh, of late is Austin Riley. And I, uh, oh, sorry, Austin Riley's in the NL, but um, I, I think Alex Bregman overall uh, has been the best third baseman um, so far to date uh, this season. He has only six home runs and 25 RBIs um, granted. However, just from whenever I've seen him at the play, he's looked absolutely locked in. Uh, he has an OBP right now of close to 400. Um, so I would put him as my uh, my my AL um, third baseman. How about how about yourself? Yeah, Bregman's he would have been on my bench uh, for my third baseman. I've got Jose Ramirez, J Ram, and this guy's probably one of the most interesting power speed combination guys because he's just like a big ball of pudge, and I can't understand how he has the wheels that he has or how he's an athlete in in an elite performing athlete. Uh, just because he's a he's a funny looking guy, he's goofy, uh, he's got a big head. And uh, I I, re- I love watching him play. I don't want to uh, uh, make this a <laughs> he's got bashing Jose, Jose Ramirez segment because he's he's awesome. But uh, he is definitely um, you know he's he's not not the greatest uh, looking athlete, but yeah, he gets it done. He's got uh, twelve home runs, forty RBIs, and in or sorry, in any other lineup, I think he'd have forty RBIs. He's got about twenty seven, twenty eight RBIs, but that Indians lineup is just is pretty bad right now. Um, and like I said, Fran Mail is down, so uh, it's not getting any better. But yeah, Jose Ramirez is is my third baseman, and probably uh, could consider Rafael Devers obviously as well. True, true. Yeah, I like Devers. I like Devers, but uh, um, would probably have him on my bench personally. But he has he has looked really good to start the year. Um, we're gonna toss it over to uh, uh, to second here, um, and I'm gonna go with uh, Jose Altuve. Might as well stick with the uh, uh, the Houston Astros Altuve, there. Yeah. yeah, the Jose is good signs um, uh. again. Uh, but hey, you know what? He's been good this year, and. Um, still, regardless of what happened, is it happened in the past? I'm going to let bygones be bygones here. Um, you know, second baseman is in a deep position, and he still has an OBP close to 360, uh, an OPS close to 800. So um, I'm liking, I'm liking what he's bringing to the plate so far. Um, his actually K to base on balls isn't as great as what I thought it would be. Nick Solak has actually really excelled in that. Uh, or sorry, hasn't excelled in that. Um, Nick Solak has been really struggling in that uh, that regard. However, I have been really impressed with him so far this year. Um, I believe his counting stats are a smidge better um, than Altuve, and he's been hitting for a bit more power uh, in terms of his total bases there. So Solak actually has 81 total bases versus Altuve 69. Um, but just the fact that Altuve has 14 walks to 22 strikeouts um, <laughs> and an OBP to 360 is where I'm putting him putting him in at the All Star game. Cool. I'm going to go with Marcus Simeon, um, hometown guy, but you know what? He's he's coming through. I think he's, he's got 23 extra extra base hits, sorry, uh, 12 home runs, 30 RBIs, and eight steals, and he's committed just one error. So Marcus Simeon is everything the Jays uh, could have dreamed for and more. So I'm really happy, and I hope he signs an extension, but I don't think he will. I think he's probably going to be playing shortstop for another team uh, and, and getting a bag. But good on Marcus Simeon for having a great first half. And I think that he has a chance to make the all-star team. He's my second baseman from second base. I'm throwing it over to shortstop and my shortstop is Sander Bogarts. Um, mm-hmm. I think it goes without saying, I don't think, I mean, you could argue Bo Bichette maybe, but Xander is the guy he's got a 400 on base. He's got 104 total bases and he's just the straw that stirs the drink for that Red Sox team. Uh, when you look at it, he's year in year out, he's putting in all-star numbers. So Xander's my shortstop. How about you? Yeah, Xander, no doubt. He's he's yeah. the uh, the all star there. Sort of stop. Uh, honorable mention though, as well. Um, I would like to shout out Bush- Bichette with nine home runs. Um, matches Bich- uh, Bogarts there, but yeah, uh, eighty six to- total bases to Bogarts uh, ninety five. Um, the only difference there, Bichette's striking out a bit more, and his OBP is about eighty ticks lower um, than what Bogarts is. So. Overall, great season so far for Bichette, but uh, you just can't can't top Bogart's almost a thousand OPS right now. So, um, and the defense too, right? Like the defense is kind of the only reason I would put Bo a, a peg down, uh, just because of those errors. And I think that you know next year will probably be an All Star season for him when, once he gets a bit better. But I think for now, like you can't discount uh, what Bogart's brings uh, to the defensive table as opposed to Bichette. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. Very true. All right, uh, move it over to to first. Yeah, one oh, bag. Uh, 
I'll let you uh, take that away. Yeah, so obviously it's it's Vladimir Guerrero Jr. How could it not be? He's the best player on the planet right now with Mike Trout hurt. And that's, I mean, he's got a 207, 207 OPS plus, which is just stupid. That means that um, if you have a 100 OPS plus, that's league average. So he's 107% better than league average hitting, which is unbelievable. Leads the world in home runs. What's What more can you say about this guy? He's played an excellent first base. Uh, he's a really awesome guy. You know, he's just, he's always smiling. He's, he's happy to play the game. And Vladdy Guerrero is my first baseman. Cool. Yeah. It's hard to go against that. Um, I will maybe throw a couple honorable mentions, um, your way. A guy who's had a bit of a Renaissance season, even though being out in KC is Carlos Santana. Uh, I like, really like his 400 OBP. Uh, I think that he's just got a really patient eye and 35 walks to 23 strikeouts is just unheard of. You know, the fact that he's almost got, two walks to every strikeout is nuts, uh, especially in a league w- where everyone's striking out like crazy and no, and not as many people are walking. So um, really enjoying his contributions there. Also 27 RBIs and seven home runs as well. So uh, yeah, Vladdy uh, runs away with it there, but uh, I just want to mention Carlos Santana as well. Cool. So uh, over to left field now, and I actually didn't see a ton of left fielders that I thought were deserving for a starting spot. So I put two right fielders, and I'm going to have Mitch Hanniger play left uh, because he's been excellent. 13 home runs, uh, 34 runs scored. And yeah, like I said, um, I, I obviously would have Aaron Judge playing right. Um, he's my right fielder, of course. But uh, Mitch Hanniger is going to play uh, in the seven spot for me. How about you? Now, a guy who's been pretty surprising who, depending on what you're valuing or in, in a, a pick, I do just want to mention Mark Canha uh, again, another guy who, who does walk a lot, but yep. has also scored a ton of runs for uh, the athletics. They're leading, leading off for them. Um, but as you mentioned, not a ton of great left fielders Um there i would say probably michael brantley with the 329 average but still only three home runs and 14 rbis um mm-hmm. not not That's really not even that that sexy right. right so i kind of agree with agree with what you're saying there with uh maybe choosing two right fielders so just to skip over and, and maybe just address right field as well hanniger has been great judge has been great tay oscar has been great the right fielders are just stacked compared to the left fielders but yeah i honestly would put three <laughs> three right fielders in the in the al over any of the left fielders that uh, are on the option there um so let's let's go over to center yeah for sure and that's actually it's it's kind of um not usually the case that left field is that shallow but we will make our way over to center and like i said it's adelise garcia for me if mike trout's not available uh obviously mike trout's gonna start if he is uh but yeah how could you not like the breakout star adelise garcia with his 15 homers 40 rbis and five steals uh he's my center fielder cool i i will even though with only 24 games played barring you know him being healthy for the all-star game um i still want to throw byron buxton out there because before he went down he was batting 370 he had nine home runs, 10 doubles, 17 RBIs, and 71 total bases, uh, yeah. an OBP over 400, an OPS over uh, 1.1 in 24 games played. So this guy was absolutely blowing the roof off before he got hurt. Also, I'm just going to uh, throw a few guys on the bench that I haven't mentioned. J.D. Martinez, just dingers, um, and Matt Olson. Have <laughs> just been dingers. Hard. Uh, so they would also be on my team. And then uh, just in the bullpen there, uh, I would probably go, you know, Roldis Chapman. Karen Chack's been really, really good for the uh, Indians. And then uh, Liam Hendricks, I'd probably throw as my third reliever. Um, and on to the National League, I'm going to start at pitcher. And my uh, my pitcher is going to be Trevor Bauer uh, because he's got to start the All-Star game. It's all about the fans. The fans want Bauer. They want the Bauer outage. And, yeah, he's been lights <laughs> out. Um Probably the best pitcher in the NL. Has he been? Uh, would you agree with that? Hmm, that's tough. Uh, there's a lot of good pitchers in the NL. Hmm. I mean, Corbin. Byrne. I don't know. I don't have enough to argue against it. But I mean, Brandon Woodruff's been unreal. Kevin Gosman's been unreal. Degrom has been him his filthy self. Obviously, just came back a little while ago from injury. Uh, you see, you Darvish pitching very well as well. Uh, it's hard hard to say, hard to say. So he hasn't definitively been the best player, but there's definitely a case for him to be the best pitcher in the NL right now. 
Yeah, because my five were Corbin Burns, Trevor Bauer, Yu Darvish, Max Scherzer, and Jack Flaherty. But it seems like in the National League, there's just a lot of starting pitchers that are deserving uh, of an all-star spot. So we're only doing five. That's just kind of the way it shakes out. But uh, those are my starting pitchers. Quickly, before we leave the uh, the one position, I'll go through a few relievers here. Um, we got Josh Hader, obviously, doing his thing. Mark Melanson has been as good as anyone could have imagined for the Friars. And Richard Rodriguez from the Pirates has been really, really good too. Uh, in limited action, I think he's thrown in 20 innings this year. He's got like a .45 ERA or something stupid, but he's obviously going to be the Pirates' lone all-star if they have one. I think they have to. Is that is that a thing too? Luke, yeah, yeah I think you have to have one from every team. Yeah, yeah you got to. Okay. Yeah, another uh, reliever who kind of came out of nowhere uh, to start the year is Alex Reyes. He's got a .69 ERA in 14 saves right now um, with 36 Ks and 26 innings pitch. So he's been pretty lights out as well, as lights out as as uh, you can get for the Cardinals there. So just talking on, on relievers, I um, want to bring him up as well. Um, I did already mention a lot of my starting pitchers, so I won't go too deep uh, into that. Nice, nice. Uh, all right, let's get it over to catcher. Uh, it's hard to go against Buster Posey and what he's doing over there in San Francisco. He's hit the fountain of youth. He is, uh, I think that the the off season last year where he didn't play, obviously probably helped him rejuvenate his body. Uh, and he, I think he had like two calendar years almost away from the game uh, with not playing in COVID and then uh, recovering from an injury. So, uh, yeah, Buster Posey's my pick a catcher, and I, I'm loving it. You know, this is th- these are the guys, Luke, that we grew up on. You Buster Posey, uh, the Mad Bums, the uh, Tim Lentz comes from the San Francisco teams that won those World Series. So it's just it's nostalgic, and it's it's great to see them succeeding. Yeah. Definitely. I, I, it is uh, unexpected, but nice to see. And I, I always like when the Giants are good. I think it just makes the league better. So I'm a big uh, big believer in, in, in San Fran. And I think that they're actually going to do some damage this year. I think they're going to be a dangerous team. Let's throw it down to third now. I'm actually going with uh, Chris Bryant, though, uh, from the Cubs. I'm really impressed with what he's been able to do so far. And, um, I mean, what, what more can you say? He's got a 400 on base, 32 runs scored. I love the kind of fuck you attitude he has towards the Cubs front office. Uh, you know, the, the whole contract thing with him, it's been botched from the start. The service time manipulation, everything um, has just been a little bit mangled uh, in terms of how they've handled him as a player. And I think that it's not going to be long before he uh, goes to a different team and um, has probably writes a book about uh, all of the different things he's experienced. You know, I think he was down in Iowa, their AAA team, uh, and just hating life down there in Des Moines or uh, what's the other <laughs> town? That's the only town I know in Iowa. So I'm just going to say Des Moines. Iowa City. Iowa I'm City and Iowa. Iowa City. There's probably some good ones, but uh, yeah. yeah, Chris Bryant's been great. He's looking like an MVP, and he's my third baseman. I mean, it's tough. Nolan Arenado's on my bench, uh, but those are the two that come to mind for me. Probably Arenado. Actually, I'm changing my mind. It's Arenado because of the defense, and that's that's how I'm going to end that. We're going to throw it over yeah. to second, and you're going to give your second baseman. Yeah, I mean, he also has 32 RBIs and 10 home runs. That's kind of tough, yeah, to, tough to argue against. Sides, for sure. Yeah. All right, uh, let's do let's do second. I'm going to be biased and Jake Cronenworth. Um, you know, only four home runs. Yes, only 15 RBIs. He's been, but he plays the game hard. He gives great at bats. Uh, he's a better player than he is a fantasy player, I think. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think he just makes every team he's on better. Uh, he's got a 407 OBP. His OPS is still hovering around 900, even though he's not known as being. Uh, a very powerful hitter. Um, and he's got an average around three, 330. Um, and he's batting in the top third of a really, really good lineup. So, yeah, probably not the sexiest pick, but heck, I'm going to throw him out there. Yeah, I was just looking at Jake Cronenworth, and I think that he's hit safely in like 12 of his last 13 games. He's got multi-hit games in like seven of those. So he's been really good. Obviously, he's been great defensively too. Uh, but my second baseman's going to be Max Muncy. And, I mean, he's drawn 42 walks this year, Luke. So he's got a 459 on base percentage how can you not get that in your starting lineup at, at the uh, keystone position? Um, he's getting my starting nod there and we're going to throw it over to shortstop. Uh, I'll let you start there at short. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for me, just from a, a, like a fantasy perspective as well. Um, Trey Turner is just like such a stud. Like it's hard to go against him. I, every game I've watched, he's just mashed the ball and he's just so athletic and, and quick as well. 
it would be between him and Fernando, uh, yeah. and yeah, exactly, and Fernando Tatis. So, um, I mean, tough, tough to go against Tatis as well because a uh, uh, such a a great player in his own right. I think Tatis is more exciting to to watch. I think he's more of like a fan favorite. So, for what the All Star Game is and what the uh, you're, you're trying to showcase, I think you got to put Tatis in. But damn, Trey Turner is also um, kind of hiding a little bit uh, in in the shadow that Tatis is casting because he is a very, very good young player in his own right. Yeah, and is it just me or does Washington kind of seem like a small market team? Like, I, I don't know. I just feel like the Nationals, nobody really talks about them and maybe it's because they're underperforming. The National League East is terrible right now. I think the Mets are leading the division with like a 22 and 20 record. But uh, Trey Turner, is he's awesome. I, I agree with that pick. I think that I'd probably pick Fernando Tatis Jr. Uh, he looks like he's on pace for a 30-30 season. He's got 13 home runs and an 11 steals. And like you said, it's an all-star game. It's for the fans. And who better to represent uh, the National League at shortstop than Fernando Tatis Jr. With just he's, – he's, he's the face of baseball. Let's face it, right? So um, definitely got to say, say Nando. Um, so we'll chuck it over to first, and you give your first baseman for the National League. Yeah, first baseman. Uh, this is – this is a tough one. Um, there's a lot of good hitting first baseman. Freddie Freeman, I think, leads up that list. I was actually going to put Max Muncy down down here as well because um, he does have first and second base eligibility. Although I'd probably still put Freeman ahead of him, even though he's been struggling by his standards this year with only a 241 average. So uh, I, I don't know. He'll turn it around more as the season goes on. Um, just honorable mention to Jesus Aguilar and Reese Hoskins as well. Uh, they've also been great. Um, and so, like, I actually, I forgot to mention at first base back in the AL, who just crossed my mind now is Jared Walsh. He's been absolutely unreal as well. So yeah, sorry, going back to the AL a little bit there, but, no, no, um, sure, it's he's, great he's really, well. yeah, um, he's been great this year. So, uh, picking Freddie Freeman, but more based off of, again, as you said, being a fan favorite, being someone that the fans want to see, um, despite only batting 241 right now. Yeah, and I mean, he had a slow start last year and ended up winning the MVP, right? So uh, Freddie Freeman's my pick, too. He's rebounding from another slow start. Uh, and his numbers do actually look all-star worthy. He's got 12 home runs and 29 RBIs with a 365 on base. That's good enough for me. And just knowing Freddie Freeman, he's only going to turn those numbers up to another level uh, once the weather uh, heats up a little bit. So Freddie Freeman's my first baseman as well. Uh, but yeah, Max Muncy does play at a lot of different positions. I think that now that Albert Pujols is on the Dodgers, which I don't think we've even mentioned on this program. Um, in fact, that's stopping me right in my tracks. Can we just take one minute to acknowledge the greatness of Albert Pujols? Uh, what the Angels did the Angels do him dirty there? Uh, give twenty seconds on that before uh, we continue on with the outfield. Hmm. Did they do him dirty? I don't know. Do, I don't do the Angels owe him. Uh, maybe they do. Uh, I honestly think that the Cardinals probably owed him more um, than the Angels did because his legacy is more with the Cards. Um, if anything, it would have been nice to see him traded back to the Cardinals to end his career. But you know, he won. Maybe probably wanted to stay in LA, stay in his million dollar house. So maybe they had a conversation with him and they didn't completely screw him over. They were just like, "Look, we need to move you. We're trying to make playing time for uh, for Jared Walsh here. Where do you want to go?" Tell us where you want to go and we'll send you there. And he probably said, I want to go to the Dodgers. So I don't think they screwed him over entirely, but uh, I think it's never a good look to take a player of his caliber and his status and his contribution to the game and sort of ship him out at the end of his career. It doesn't always look the greatest and leaves a sour taste, but uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I just thought it was interesting that he was fighting to uh, be put in the lineup against Ryan Yarbrough, um, who is a tough lefty, always seems to get the best of the Jays. And really one of uh, every time I see Yarbrough pitching and uh, I'm always just like, oh, this is going to be a boring game to watch because he just he gives up weak contact. And I don't think Pujols really would have succeeded if he was put in the lineup against uh, Yarbrough that day. Uh, his skills are diminishing and it's too bad. I love the guy. I think he's probably 48, 49 years old uh, <laughs> on the, the falsified uh, birth certificates. Like I don't. I don't think anybody thinks he is the age that he says he is, uh, but he's a legend and I'm glad that he's getting a second chance this year. I really didn't want to see him uh, end his career that way. So really glad there. Uh, if you want, we'll shift over to the outfield now uh, because I do want to round out this segment uh, mm-hmm. and on to left field. Uh, I'll let you start. Yeah. Left field again is just sort of a, a weak, weak area. Um, 
I don't know if anyone comes to your mind that uh, well, is standing out to you, but no one really, no one really pops my interest right away. I mean, is Acuna a right fielder? Like, I can't remember. I consider him a right fielder, but maybe I'm just classifying him wrong. I, I could honestly, be honestly. I don't. I don't know whether he's a left or a right fielder, but let's just say he's a left fielder, and we'll put Acuna out there. I, because, I yeah. think I just checked here. He's a right fielder according to okay. uh, just the classification of him. Um, well, I mean, we're gonna we've got Mookie over there and right, so we're gonna need to put Acuna in left anyways. So yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's it's okay. outfielders outfielder at this point. Who don't really? I mean, it means no worries, right? Acuna Matata. Yeah. So we'll stick him <laughs> up there, <laughs> and on to the eight position. I'll get. Oh, I mean, we just mentioned Mookie, but uh, maybe you want to. Maybe you've got a different perspective. Maybe you've got a different take. I mean, Nick Castellanos, Bryce Harper, those are also great players as well. I think you put mm-hmm. all those guys um, in the lineup, and it's all star game. You can put one of them in center if you need to. So yeah, it exactly. Really like if it were up to me, I would put Mookie in center and put Nick Castellanos in right. I know Nick isn't probably the best defensive player, but he deserves to be starting based on his performance so far. Probably over Juan Soto, who's a center fielder. I'd probably put Mookie in center uh, and Castellanos in right. That's probably what I would do. True. True. Um, okay, for, for center, uh, unfortunately, Trent Grisham just hit the IL, but he would have been my uh, starting center fielder. Um, just like his game. Like the speed power combo. Uh, I also love the no batting gloves. I think it's just nails, and it's a guy I want to watch play in the All Star game. No. Um, but yeah, Shamey's just got hurt again. The no batting gloves is cool, but the golf grip is even cooler. Like this guy swings like I've never seen anybody swing the bat before. He just decided he's going to swing it like a golf club. It's it's crazy. Like <laughs> Frank Grisham, and I'll say one thing: in 2019, when he had that fuck up against the Nationals in the playoffs, when the ball went under his legs or went under his glove. Uh, they shipped his ass out of town right after that play. And I thought that they they did him dirty there. I think that that was a frustration, um, quick decision that, uh, I mean, this he, he had a really productive year that year. He was really good, I remember. He was a, a breakout fantasy guy. And they just said, uh, get lost. Like, you, you lost us the series. Uh, the Nats went on to win the World Series. And they weren't happy about it. But you know what? You can't just ruin a young guy's confidence like that errors happen and it i thought that was a bit bush league that they just kicked him out over one error uh, i know it was costly but uh didn't like to see that they got luis arias uh from the padres in that trade and it looks like the padres have won that trade so far yeah i agree um i agree urias looks okay but yeah trent grisham is in my opinion the best center fielder in that now so uh, he's good defensively as well which can't be uh, understated so, I, sorry, dude, who was your pick for the for center field there? I was going to slot Mookie over to center and have... Mookie slot Mookie, Mookie, okay. Right. But I'm just going to mention a few guys before we uh, round out the segment on my bench. Jesse Winker, he's got to be on that team. Yeah, uh, for sure. Harper, Trey Turner, Arenado. Well, Arenado or Bryant, whoever's starting, I can't decide. And mm-hmm. Osbaldis. So those are my bench guys. You got any uh, ideas for any other guys that might deserve a spot? No, I think we touched on all those guys um, pretty much other than Albies there. Albies has struggled from my understanding. I haven't watched him super close this season, but uh, I know he was been, really cold, but he's heating up again? Yeah, yeah, he's really heated up. He started the season 0 for 27, like like you just alluded to, but yeah, he's really heated up, and uh, he's looking like the old Aussie Albies, so he's looking really good. Okay, cool. Yeah, then I, I'm on board with that. Um, I think that uh, that rounds it out. That's great, man. That was our uh, Around the Horn early season all-stars edition i think that was a success we're actually going to introduce a new segment now called the seventh inning stretch and uh this is basically the idea the premise behind this segment is that um we're both going to give a take um where we're going to say it'll probably be an exaggeration so uh, i'm going to start off and i'm going to give a bit of a stretch take in saying that mike trout is unfortunately not going to be remembered as the greatest player of all time. And I hate saying this. Uh, I really do because I'm a Trout fanboy. But durability is a huge part of what makes a player great to me. And he's just not available for his team for 162 games a year or anywhere close to that. If you look at the um, age 25 to 29 uh, seasons, he's missed 116 games. So... It's bringing a lot of Ken Griffey Jr. vibes. And uh, Luke, I, I got to ask you, do you think that a guy's durability affects his greatness? Because I'm I'm looking through this in a different lens where I want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt. But at the same time, man, you got to do some plyometrics or get your body right because you, can, you just can't be 
letting your team down like this. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm coming at this from a, from a wrong perspective, but that's why it's a stretch take. Hmm. Yeah. If you are there 162 games of the year, you're obviously going to contribute a lot more just with more volume is going to come more production, especially with a player of that caliber. The issue that I have with saying, Oh, just do more plyometrics is that I think he does. I think he is someone who is very focused on his craft. Unfortunately, he's a freak specimen of an athlete and baseball is such an explosive sport where one explosive movement in the wrong direction can cause problems for him. And he is a guy who puts a lot of miles on his body. He'd steal a lot of bags. So, you know, when he, I believe tore uh, something in his thumb, I was sliding into second base or coming back into first on a, um, on a, a try to pick off move there on him. So he definitely puts a lot of wear and tear on his body because he does play really hard. Um, he, works hard defensively um i don't know it's it's hard to say maybe it's it could be bad luck but at this point you do have a point it it has become a pattern i don't think he's had one healthy year uh in the last five or so or maybe even his entire career for all i know so it could be tough maybe that that's the difference between the angels making the playoffs and not making the playoffs is those you know four weeks of these of the season when he's not there maybe if he's there all of a sudden they're making the playoffs every year who knows so that that does come down to it but really do I think that it's under his control? I don't believe so. Do I think it's going to affect his legacy? Yes, 100%. I think it will make him not as good of a player as um, he would, would have been remembered otherwise because he's just not there the whole time to contribute and help his team make the playoffs. Well, that's like you, ju- you just said it right there. The Angels get so much flack for not putting enough talent around this guy to get them to the playoffs. But it's never brought up that he's not available for them either uh, on a consistent basis. And I don't want to make this sound like, you know, he's the injuries obviously are what they are. It's not like he's, he's trying to get hurt. Um, But to me, durability is important. And I think that it's something that can't be overlooked. I'm looking at some of his career totals and I mean, he's got 310 home runs. I think that if he gets in those hundred and let's say he plays in 80 of those 116 games, that's probably closer to over 350, probably somewhere where he could be within striking distance of, you know, Barry Bonds. And now when you look at the end of his career, people who never got to see him play are just going to look at his numbers and be like, oh, this is the guy you guys were going crazy about. Like, what's so special about him? And I mean, look, I'll always hold great uh, fond memories of watching him play. I stay up late to watch him every time I get the chance to, but it's unfortunate. And I think that, um, that's just my exaggerated take. I think that he's not going to be remembered as the greatest of all time. And that's just unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair point. Um, Hard to say who will be known as the greatest of all time. Cause heck you got Tatis coming up. You have Juan Soto coming up. Who knows? Well, well, my biggest point I think that I'm trying to make here is I think Ken Griffey jr. Would have been known as the greatest player of all time today. If he didn't have all those injury concerns and miss all that time, I think that it would be, we wouldn't even be having the debate about who the best is. I think Ken would have been the best of all time. So, mm-hmm. um, like you said, there's a lot of candidates, uh, baseball's in great hands. It could be Juan Soto. It could be Vlad jr. Uh, who knows? But I just think, uh, when you think about the goat you, right now, you think of Mike Trout and, yeah, I, I was hoping that this wouldn't be a trend that we would have to uh, talk about, but it, it unfortunately has been. So with that, I'll let you give your um, seventh inning stretch. All right, my seventh inning stretch is that the Miami Marlins are going to finish second in the NL East. Um, I'm interested to see where they can go. Uh, they don't have the best hitting lineup, but hey, who knows? Maybe if they're on the bubble for the playoffs come the end of the year, um, Miami, for the first time ever, might get off their wallets a little bit and uh, make a bit of a push. So I'd actually be pretty confident to say that they will finish ahead of the New York Mets. So even without the, the offensive capabilities like we've talked about over these last few weeks, you're confident that they've got enough to, to get it done? I think they do. I think uh, pitching in the ballpark that they have, um, I think that they could get it done. Uh, right now, obviously, the New York Mets are um, in first and then in the division, but I could see Miami overtaking them. Um, I think that there's a lot of untapped potential there, uh, especially once you get Jazz back as well. I uh, maybe mm-hmm. he just came back recently, um, but at least put playing back at a hundred percent. And I don't really know too much about their farm system, but I know that they've been stocking picks for a while, so they've got to have some talent you somewhere. Um, who knows who they bring up and who just catches fire? So yeah. I'm if they can hit on some prospects that they got just sitting around in the farm system and can come up and provide a spark. I think they've got a legitimate shot at finishing second uh, and then at well, least there. 
Well, one guy I know who has been a giant disappointment is Lewis Brinson, who they yeah. got in the Christian Yelich trade. Um, he he's never amounted to very much of anything. Uh, but yeah, I, I like the Marlins. I like what they have there. Um, it's a, it is definitely an exaggerated take because I, it would take a lot for them to get to the playoffs. But like you mentioned, the NL East is, is a joke right now. I mean, the Mets are leading the division and they have less wins than four of the other teams behind them. So it just makes no sense. And I think that I could, I could probably see that. I think that that's within striking distance for the Marlins and they probably do have the best rotation like you alluded to. And yeah, that's a good take. I, I'll respect that take and I'll, I'll accept that. Um, are they also, did you like, sorry, did you see the new city edition jerseys that they uh, just presented a few, I think on the weekend they wore them the whole series? No, are they ugly or what? Uh, I don't know. They're all right. They're, they're red. Um, I'll throw up a picture here on the uh, YouTube video. So when you get a chance to go back and watch the YouTube, you can see what it looks like. But yeah, it's red. Uh, they sure. got baby blue in there. It's very, it's not actually that Miami. Uh, no? You'd think it'd be like some Miami Vice type of shit, but. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. I don't know. I don't really understand it. Uh, <laughs> but it is what it is. And uh yeah, so is that um, is that your final exaggerated take of the seventh inning stretch? Are we going yep. to we're going to get the peanuts and the cracker jacks on with and uh, finish the game? Let's do it. Yeah, we uh, finish the stretch and uh, let's get the relievers out and you know get the cars running. Sounds good. So let's round out this edition of the Bloop and a Blast by having a Jay's talk because I, I've been waiting for this um, since we last spoke, Luke. Um, the Jays took two of three from the Phillies. Uh, then the Red Sox took two of three from the Jays. And then we got swept in that four game series against Tampa. Uh, last night we beat the Yankees and it's been one after another, man. This schedule has been brutal for the Jays. They have had the third hardest schedule according to ESPN. And it's not going to get any better until late June when we got two series against Baltimore. Uh, then we play Seattle and the Marlins. And that's when it kind of lightens up a bit. So um, there's a lot to go over. It's been frustrating seeing us lose ground, as I said, uh, to those teams, our competitors in the AL East. So what stood out to you as in, in terms of what our biggest problem has been uh, as of late? <laughs> well, from the one game that I actually watched um, the most consistently of was the <laughs> three walks uh, that scored uh, three runs uh, against Tampa. So, I mean, one walks from the bullpen. Um, I think there was, I forget how many uh, committed total in the inning, um, but walks from the bullpen definitely hurt. The The bullpen, which had been so reliable to start this season, definitely was starting to crack the last couple of games that I had caught. And I only caught the tail end of those games. So maybe that's just the narrative that I saw because I was watching the relievers pitch. But um, it did seem that, uh, um, that the bullpen was starting to show some cracks now that hadn't been there to start the year. So that's something that has me concerned. Yeah, I think they're a bit overused. And I mean, I think one of these days, Rafael Delis is going to give me cardiac arrest because uh, that guy is just a mess sometimes. And he's very uh, he's a very anxiety inducing pitcher to watch because he takes so fucking long to throw those pitches. And he he makes you wonder whether it's going to be uh, the result that you're looking for as a fan. And um, I love their bullpen. I still believe in those guys. I think Flatwood is, you know, he had that one uh, rough start or rough uh, relief inning there where Montoyo took him out. I don't know if you saw that, but he wasn't happy about it. And then um, they blew the game there with the three straight bases loaded walks. That was pretty brutal. Uh, but Romano, he's been shaky. Uh, these guys are just overworked, like I said. And I think that um, once uh, guys like Mats and Robbie Ray and Ryu um, continue to throw 110 pitches and get us deeper into games, uh, it'll lighten their workload and we'll see a bit better performances from them. Yeah, I agree. Uh, as the summer goes on, pitchers are going to go deeper in ball games, but how do you feel about the Jays' defense? Uh, from what I've seen, Vladdy's been more than passable, as we mentioned at the start of the year. Vladdy's actually been looked really, really good uh, at first base, and I think he's been getting better progressively, so that's a positive sign. How do you think about the rest of the team and how their defense is stacking up? I think the defense has actually gotten a lot better. 
Um, Bo's not making uh, as egregious errors that he was making earlier in the season. Um, and, you know, when you get Springer back, that's obviously when you're going to see uh, the full capabilities of that defense because he just covers so much ground. And uh, when you look at some of Lourdes's, um, you know, routes that he takes to the balls, I think that that'll be masked a little bit um, by Springer coming back. Uh, when you get Gritchick over to right field, you've got a great arm and right. I like Tiosco over there, too. He's got a nice arm. Uh, so I really do like the defense. And like you said, vladdy has been um, more than passable. He's been actually been very good over there. Um, so the defense has been good. My major concern is left-handed bats in the lineup uh, because – Rowdy Telez, um, he, the experiment is not working with him. And the experiment, to an extent, hasn't really worked with Kevin Biggio, even though he's more of an everyday guy who's going to get a lot of rope. So you need a guy in there who you can rely on. And I'm just wondering, um, is it like a guy like Joey Gallo that we need to go after? Or who is it that is a left-handed bat who might be available that could really help us out? Because I think we're not going anywhere without a left-handed bat and a right-handed starter to anchor the rotation. Well, just focusing on a positive right here is Alec Manoa as well. There's a right-handed pitcher on whether he's going to anchor the rotation or not is to be seen. But at least that's something to focus on on the positive Uh, in terms of a left-handed bat. Those are hard to find. Left-handed power bats are not always the easiest to to come across. So I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one. I'm just going to hope that, you know, the right-handed pitching can be solved hopefully by Alec and he's as good as he was in the minors. Yeah, it's too bad that Manoa's start got obviously pushed to tomorrow due to the uh, rainouts. There was actually a lot of rainouts across the uh, major leagues tonight. But I think he pitches at 4 o'clock Eastern tomorrow, so that, I guess that's one Pacific for you. And I'm going to be really interested interested to see what he does. Obviously, from a fantasy perspective, I've held on to him for a few weeks now. Uh, and he, he just looks awesome. I think he had a .5 ERA in the minors uh, through 18 innings, uh, 27 to 3 K to walk. So obviously everybody in uh, Blue Jays land is very excited to see Alec Manoa, as you mentioned. But I just think it's a lot to ask. I mean, he is obviously um, very inexperienced. Uh, which is something that needs to be accounted f- I mean, you've got to probably think about that when you're talking about, is this guy going to help you in the playoffs? Um, if they let him, maybe. But obviously the innings are going to be a concern when you get to October, if we're even lucky enough to get there. Um, so I do think that a guy like maybe Max Scherzer, if he's available, uh, would be interesting. The only thing is... Um, I don't know that he would probably want to go to Toronto or uh, Buffalo or wherever they're playing because of the uncertainty, Uh, just knowing that he's got a family and I think he's got four dogs, uh, which is crazy. And uh, but Max Scherzer is a guy that uh, would just put us into World Series contention right away. And I just uh, hope that that could happen. Mike Rizzo, uh, it is worth noting that he didn't trade Bryce Harper in his walk year. So if that's not the case, if if the Nationals are still struggling and they're not willing to part with Max Scherzer, then I don't know. It's it's I just know that we do need a right handed arm uh, and maybe Max is is a too upper echelon. He's too elite. Um, you're just not going to be able to get a guy like that. But hey, it'd be great if we did. And uh, uh, I'll settle for like a Kevin Bosman or something like that if we can. 